So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Noel and I am the program manager for uh, the Education and Outreach Core at the University of Vermont Center on Rural Addiction. I'm also here with Education and Outreach Research Assistant Eleanor Broy and Program Advisor Erin Colliday, who will be helping to run this webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And as you are entering the session, you are automatically muted and your cameras are turned off. So today's webinar is entitled Illicit Drug Supply 2023 Fentanyl and Xylazine, presented by Dr. Richard Rawson. The Community Rounds Workshop Series is a live webinar series held monthly by the UVM Center, uh, UVM Center on Rural Addiction to provide opportunities for health professionals and community partners to learn and ask questions. We discuss topics related to science-based best practices for substance use disorders. So we are excited to get started with the webinar, but before we begin, I would like to, as usual, go over a couple of reminders. We do encourage you to ask questions, for, so feel free to enter them into the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, shown by the red arrow there. We are going to review as many of them as we have time for during the Q&A period at the end. Um, this session is being recorded and will be delivered along with the slides to your mailbox next week. After Dr. Rawson has finished his, his presentation, and just before we have our Q&A, we will share a very short poll to assist us with our evaluation. And we would love for you to complete this short poll um, before we have our questions. You're gonna see it right in the center of your screen. If people are comfortable, we um, would love to have you use the chat box to introduce yourself to the group by sharing your name and your organization and what community that you are coming from. We are also grateful for any comments that you'd like to share about the webinar itself. Be sure to select panelists and attendees when you use the chat feature so that your peers can connect with you. We are also pleased to offer live captioning for today's event and to access the captions, please see the chat. We are going to provide a link for you. Continuing education credits are available for both those who attend this session live and those who watch the recording within one month of the live event. During the session, we will share the link in the chat box uh, for instructions on how to claim your credits. You're also going to get those instructions again via email when you receive the recording and the slides. If you have any questions, you can contact us at cora at uvm.edu. Um, again, please uh, claim these credits within 30 days of the live webinar. There are no disclosures for this community round session and all potential conflicts of interest have been resolved. Uh, Dr. Rawson, you can now share your screen. I'm going to stop sharing mine. And um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Eli Klemperer, who will be introducing our speaker today. Dr. Klemperer is the co-director of the Education and Outreach Corps for the UVM Center on Rural Addiction. And he's an assistant professor at the University of Vermont in the departments of psychiatry and psychological sciences. Dr. Ro uh, Dr. Klemperer, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jenny. I'm uh, very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Rick Rawson to give the talk today. Rick is a research professor at the University of Vermont, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, and a professor emeritus at the UCLA Department of Psychiatry. He received a PhD in experimental psychology right here from the University of Vermont in 1974, and has conducted numerous clinical trials on pharmacology, uh, psychosocial and behavioral addiction treatments for individuals with opioid cocaine and methamphetamine use disorders. He's led addiction research and training programs for the United Nations, World Health Organization, the US State Department, and has exported science-based knowledge to many parts of the world. He's a member of the Motivational Incentives Policy Group, 
which is a volunteer group that is working to reduce barriers to the use of contingency management for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. He is currently providing technical assistance to eight states uh, in the United States on the development of treatment services for individuals with stimulant use disorder. Dr. Rawson has published three books, 40 book chapters, and over 250 peer-reviewed articles. It's conducted many workshops, paper presentations, and training sessions. Rick is without a doubt an internationally renowned expert in addictions and truly a wealth of knowledge with all things related to the treatment of substance use disorders. We're lucky to have him here at UVM and very much looking forward to his talk today. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Eli. And thanks for, for the nice introduction. And I'm going to, um, hello everybody. I'm gonna start with an apology. I have too much information. Um, and so I'm going to be going through these slides pretty quickly. Um, hopefully you can either ask questions at the end and we will cover them or you can send questions. You'll get the PowerPoint for yourselves so you'll be able to um, see the information if I go over any of it too quickly. I, I have a friend who I work with. He sent me three new xylazine article uh, abstracted into PowerPoints this morning. So uh, I wasn't able to incorporate those, but uh, there's a lot of new information occurring uh, very rapidly. Uh, I have no disclosures. This is the objectives of the, the talk, uh, just to cover these drugs on their effects and what some of the uh, treatment uh, and harm reduction implications are. First off, I'm gonna talk about uh, the data on overdose deaths uh, through 2021. Uh, and the big story there, there's really two stories. One is uh, fentanyl, which in this, uh, in this slide is synthetic opioids, uh, the uh, fifth column over with a 24.4% one year increase in overdose deaths related to fentanyl. Uh, then you see a 20% increase in overdose deaths associated with cocaine and the data on overdose deaths associated with methamphetamine. Right now we have essentially a three or well, a two headed uh, overdose death crisis with fentanyl and stimulants being the two major components of that. Uh, certainly it's, it's uh, likely that fentanyl causes most of the fatalities, although it's, certain, it's certainly the case that we do see people dying from stimulant overdose without fentanyl, something in the neighborhood of 15% of all the deaths in the United States overdose deaths were uh, stimulants alone. Uh, the, the rest are almost 90% uh, with fentanyl. This gives you a bit of a breakdown of the rural urban um, uh, rates of overdose death, as you can see. In the uh, the dark blue areas are where uh, overdose deaths are higher, the rates are higher in urban centers, and in the uh, light blue or gray ones, including Vermont, New York, and California, uh, the rates overdose death rates are higher in rural areas than in uh, urban areas. the The idea that there are higher overdose rates in urban or in rural areas is a 21st century phenomenon. That's never been the case before. Um, and during most of my career, drug overdose deaths, or I guess we're now calling them poisonings, um, were uh, always associated with urban drug use. Uh, but we now see in many parts of the United States in rural areas, uh, very high rates. The green uh, ones are the, show that there's no difference. So when you add the gray ones to the green ones, there's a big part of the United States where overdose death, the overdose death rate is uh, substantially high in rural areas. It's not an urban uh, issue anymore. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the situation here in uh, Vermont, this is our current data for 2022 up through September. Um, and as you can see, the uh, fentanyl is definitely driving the overdose death problem. We're seeing it in, you know, literally 90% of uh, overdose deaths, very few prescription opioids and even fewer heroin uh, overdose deaths. So for the, those um, deaths that we're seeing, fentanyl is the big driver. 
Let's talk a little bit about fentanyl. I'm not going to give a lot of data on fentanyl. I presume most people have heard or read some information on fentanyl. Fentanyl comes into the United States in two different forms. It comes in in powder form, the lower panel here, which it tends to be a whiter color than the than heroin. Well, though heroin comes in in all different colors, but um, fentanyl does come in, in in powder form. Uh, there's a lot of debate about whether the drugs coming into the United States now are coming in with fentanyl already blended in, or whether fentanyl comes in by itself and then is mixed together with uh, other drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. Uh, but it's coming in, in in very high quantities. Part of the reason that fentanyl is, is having such a moment in our uh, drug uh, history is that it's easy, it's cheap to make, and it's um, the, the quantities that are needed are very small. If you can, people can relate to a five pound bag of sugar. A five pound bag of sugar would have approximately 1 million lethal doses of fentanyl. Uh, so it's, it doesn't take much. You can smuggle it across the border uh, in, in relatively small quantities and still have enough fentanyl to make a lot of money and kill a lot of people. Um, the, just from uh, the point of view of, for accurate information, the, the idea, the, the drug is coming across the border, no question about it. It's being produced in, now mostly in southwestern Mexico on the, on the Pacific coast. And most of it is coming in in container ships through the Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle ports. Um, the idea of people running across the border with knapsacks full of uh, fentanyl, that's not how it's coming into the country. It's not being smuggled in by individuals. It's being smuggled in in a very sophisticated uh, way and in larger quantities, mostly through container ships. Um, but as you can see here, it doesn't take much fentanyl to produce a, uh, a lethal dose. That's a 30 milligram dose of heroin, which is a lethal dose, and a three milligram dose of fentanyl, which is uh, a lethal dose. <clears throat> so three milligrams is, is not very much. Uh, and, and when you mix it in with other drugs, it um, it can produce fatalities at a very high rate. When I was seeing patients back in California in the early 80s, um, there was one point at which there was a pharmacy burglary and fentanyl was, um, was taken out of the pharmacy and it made its way onto the street. And it was a, considered a public health emergency. There were like bulletins on the TV station about this, this incredibly lethal drug. It's really mind boggling to me that 30 years later, it's now routine, it's everywhere and it's in everything. This is an incredibly lethal drug. Um, from, here's a little bit of uh, overdose data. Um, last year, the, as of 2021, 100, more than 100,000 people died of uh, overdose, 65%. This number now is just escalating with every new set of data we see. Two thirds of the people had fentanyl in, the people who overdosed had fentanyl manufactured in, well, the, the precursors are manufactured in China and they're turned into fentanyl as with methamphetamine in, in Mexico and it's sent in in powder and in pills. Um, here's some pictures of, of fentanyl. This is, these are one of the most common. These are called N30s, which are uh, the, the, the authentic ones were oxycodone. This was one of the more popular of the uh, prescription opioids that we saw 20 years ago and during the era of the prescription opioid uh, overdose, these M30s were, were commonly used. Well, now they're um, uh, counterfeit tablets manufactured in, meth in Mexico, and they're now, they look like M30s with oxycodone, but they have fentanyl in them, and they're about 10 times stronger than the uh, oxycodone was. So in many cases, you're hearing of people, this, this, you know, the array of people involved is um, universal. Uh, college students taking a couple of pills they thought were Oxycontin and getting fentanyl and overdose dosing and dying. Um, they do send it in in these rainbow tablets that come in to, um, into the US. 
Uh, they're also pressed into Adderall and sold as Adderall. The, this is legitimate Adderall and this is counterfeit Adderall. This has no Adderall in it. It has uh, fentanyl in it. Uh, we had a situation at UCLA where three students overdosed and died within the last couple of months. Students think, thinking they were taking Adderall so they could study longer hours and dying of fentanyl overdose. So it's sold alone <clears throat> and as an adulterant um, and to allow traffic smaller quantities, but with no reduction in the drug effect. Uh, the small quantities obviously can be deadly and uh, certainly the one of the major harm reduction strategies for addressing the fact that fentanyl is so deadly is the distribution of naloxone. I won't go into the details, but there's lots of discussion about the um, doses of, of naloxone that are, are now um, necessary for reversing a fentanyl overdose. Uh, there's a lot of new literature on it. What I've heard as the basic guideline is just keep giving the naloxone until the, you can revive the person along with CPR and until the ambulance gets there. Um, and I'm sure there are more nuanced uh, discussions of this, but uh, fentanyl is an opioid and fentanyl, the, the overdose can be reversed with naloxone and naloxone is life-saving, but it does appear that you need to use higher doses, more doses, um, and use the doses for uh, over a longer period of time. This is uh, published by the National Counseling from, uh, Council, it's usually be, used to be called the National Council for Mental Health and Addiction or something, now it's Mental Wellbeing. They have this guidance on the hand uh, uh, dealing with fentanyl. As I said, it's the primary driver of the overdose crisis. Uh, it's taken knowingly and unknowingly in pills and in powder. It's about 50 times stronger than heroin. And during the initial years of fentanyl showing up, which started in about 2014, uh, we started to see increases in deaths. Many of the early deaths were people who didn't know they were getting fentanyl and were completely unaware of the fact that it was in the drug supply and they either weren't tolerant, they were taking a stimulant like cocaine, fentanyl was put in and they have an overdose and die. Now there's a much better awareness of fentanyl in the drug supply. However, that knowledge doesn't necessarily reduce uh, the risk of use or reduce the use. Um, when people get uh, addicted to opioids, um, hearing that there's very strong opioids is not a deterrent. In fact, it often can be, people will start looking for fentanyl uh, to get the, the better opioid effect. Can be taken any number of ways to, through in orally ingestion, you can snort it. Um, um, overdose by fentanyl does not occur through exposure through the skin. There have been some, um, stories of that, of uh, law enforcement folks um, coming into contact with fentanyl, touching it, and then uh, having an overdose and having to be resuscitated. Um, everything I've read, all the research that I've seen from the toxicology people make it clear that doesn't happen, that it, fentanyl is not absorbed by the skin in high enough doses to cause an overdose. Now, carfentanyl may in fact be strong enough to, to produce that. But carfentanil has is, is not been widely um, uh, detected in the United States. Um, and so the, the, with the current supply of fentanyl on the street, uh, touching it is not uh, a dangerous, but um, certainly in any, any other form of ingestion, inhaling the uh, powder uh, can produce an overdose. This, this is from the this Council on Wellbeing, the, uh, and they recommend four basic principles for addressing the fentanyl crisis. Pursue an incremental approach for behavior change. That is, try to get people to reduce their use. That um, they many of the people using drugs that, that are just fentanyl or contain fentanyl may not be ready to make a commitment for abstinence. If that's the case, 
certainly trying to get a commitment to talk to them about reducing their use or use, using in a safer way is uh, our important principles. Getting them engaged somehow, some way, in something is important. Syringe exchange, uh, coming to a, a medical clinic, coming to see a counselor, coming to for uh, hepatitis and HIV services. To connect them to the system is an important first step before we have a chance to, to often engage them in meaningful treatment and um, harm reduction, other harm reduction strategies. Um, try to get the, as much as possible, get them to show up in settings where, where healthcare can be provided, where there are mental health professionals available to see them, and be ready at this point that fentanyl is now the rule rather than the exception. Um, I'm not aware of any place in the United States where fentanyl is not widely available and fentanyl is not in most of the drug supply. Um, here in New England, where I am in Vermont, uh, in the cocaine supply, fentanyl is um, universal. In much of the country, in the methamphetamine supply, um, fentanyl has been widely uh, uh, used uh, it, uh, to supplement the, the methamphetamine supply. So it's the idea that fentanyl is a rare thing is, is no longer the case. Um, in rural areas, dealing with fentanyl issues uh, has some particular challenges. Uh, oftentimes, the, um, if in rural areas, medical professionals may not be as readily accessible. Somebody who has a, an overdose with fentanyl, oftentimes it's gonna need to be the um, People who are not trained medically who may need to have access to naloxone and be responsible for helping with resuscitation. Uh, the training of, of healthcare providers in rural areas often is more challenging. So the use of echo training services, all of that may be uh, more useful. There are some issues around people who are taking fentanyl being inducted onto buprenorphine, there being some greater challenges with um, trying to make that initial induction onto buprenorphine. And there has been some data to suggest that people are able to get on methadone more easily. Well, in many rural areas, methadone isn't widely available. So that may be an additional strategy that's needed to bring methadone into rural areas for those people who can't get started on to buprenorphine uh, because of this interaction between fentanyl and buprenorphine. The uh, core group here at the University of Vermont has a whole variety of uh, literature and handouts and information sheets, and you can get those through the uh, CORA website. This gives you some great information on uh, some of the data on fentanyl and overdoses. Uh, testing for fentanyl, very important tool for uh, communities to have to be able to understand exactly how prevalent fentanyl is in the in the supply. Also, for users to uh, people who use variety of drugs, uh, for them to have test strips to see whether or not fentanyl is in their drug supply. Um, there, these uh, there is data on the Cora website on fentanyl test strips, how you can get them. Um, uh, they're accurate. Uh, they, they can uh, detect at least 10 of the fentanyl analogs. And um, there is, I, I guess there still are some legality issues state to state, which is absurd in my opinion, uh, that um, there would be any legal barriers to having these test strips. I mean, they're not something that are, can be misused they simply can give someone the information as to whether or not there's fentanyl in the drug supply. Seems like a pretty important thing to do. Um, one study of fentanyl test strips showed 85% of people using illicit drugs wanted to know about the uh, presence of fentanyl. Um, and the, that information uh, allowed those people to uh, use a smaller dose, uh, try a non-injection route of administration. Uh, if they were going to inject, to inject more slowly, um, have naloxone available, not use alone. Um, 
And um, if you were using with other people, not everybody using at the same time. We had a situation here in Vermont six months ago at a hotel down at the Killington ski area where three people were found in a hotel, all um, fatal overdoses. And apparently they got a batch of drugs that had fentanyl. They all decided to use at the same time and they all died at the same time. So one of the harm reduction strategies is if you're, first off, don't use fentanyl. If you're going to use, don't inject fentanyl. If you're going to inject fentanyl, don't inject it alone. If you're with other people, don't everybody use it at the same time. Um, now I have to tell you, I'm somebody who spent my career doing addiction treatment. And this, how do you use these drugs safely is still a little bit weird for me to um, uh, be talking about it. Uh, but I have to say, we've never seen anything like fentanyl before. This is the most lethal drug uh, that has ever been on the street. And I really think that this the, the focus on strategies to reduce fatalities from fentanyl really has to be an overarching uh, principle for everything else that we do. Um, there is no evidence that giving people fentanyl test strips in any way gives them permission to use or encourages their use. That's nonsense. Um, giving people fentanyl test strips will allow them to have information that may save their life. Uh, so it's a really important and valuable intervention. And you can get information on fentanyl test strips from the website that Cora has set up. Um, and there's the information on the site. Uh, here's a couple of, th this is a, a study published last year on some of the strategies that were uh, recommended or that they're, um, people are thinking about. Now, a lot of this hasn't been tested out. There haven't been double-blind clinical trials on, on these strategies, but they're pretty much common sense. So people who inject drugs, um, if you're using in the current drug supply, I don't even mean to say if you're using fentanyl, because you don't really know if you're using fentanyl. If you go out and buy cocaine, or if you go out and buy methamphetamine, it's likely you also are using fentanyl. Not for sure, but it's a high likelihood. Um, these are some of the sort of harm reduction strategies, testing doses where you give yourself, or if you're going to inject, it's a smaller dose uh, with um, very small amounts. If you're with other people, one person goes first, you use fentanyl test strips. All of these things are um, uh, important uh, for people, certainly people who are going to syringe exchanges to, to uh, know about. Now, some things about fentanyl, they did some interviews with the, the people who are people who use fentanyl, and they found that uh, this is some of the things they said about it. The effect is much briefer than heroin. Um, they said it doesn't have any legs. That is, it doesn't have a long effect, 10 minutes to 15 minutes, and it wears off faster. Um, and they, th there are some uh, participant interviews that said it has more of a sedative tranquilizing effect than heroin. I'm gonna skip through these because I wanna get to xylazine. Um, and you can read these. These are comments from individuals who use uh, fentanyl. They often use it together with methamphetamine. Some feel like the fentanyl effect together with the stimulant produces a, 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 a cocktail that works well for them. And we're seeing a lot of this. The day of the individual who used one drug, and my, my career, when I was seeing patients in California, um, they were either people who used heroin, people who used cocaine, people who used methamphetamine, and there was some, but not a lot of, of mixing, of uh, combining them. Well, now that's very different. The, now that the idea that you're gonna go out and you're gonna buy a single drug with non-adulterated with any other drugs is very uh, unlikely to happen. You're, whether you intend it or not, and whether you know the dealer or don't know the dealer, um, oftentimes the dealer has no control over what's in the supply that they have. This, another, this is one I wanted to mention. There are some other uh, analogs. There's parafluorofentanyl, um, 
And another category of drug that are commonly called the zines, met metatonitazine, these are uh, also opioids. Um, uh, they're not seen everywhere around the country. This one is seen in, in Tennessee and parafluorofentanyl was seen in, uh, and I'm there at the bottom, carfentanyl, that's the one I mentioned that's a hundred times more potent than fentanyl. Very few cases in Indiana and Ohio back a year or two ago. Uh, luckily, this one has not sh shown up in, in a great amounts uh, because this is sort of a nightmare drug. Uh, and this is a couple of other ones that we, these are all things that may show up or might show up in small amounts, but are not part of uh, a very large um, um, rollout of these drugs. Fentanyl is the main one, and that's the, the one that's in, that the, the, are being produced in the labs in Mexico. Xylazine. As I said, I got these slides today. These, these, this came in this morning. This is from the New York Post this morning's headline, skin rotting, skin rotting drug trank infiltrates big cities, zombifying, zombifying, which is a term I had never heard of before, um, zombifying bodies. Now, this is the traditional United States cold, cool, rational approach to a new uh, drug problem. Obviously, they're showing this as the boogeyman. This is the new boogeyman that is um, the worst thing we've ever seen and, and all of that. Well, it this is a drug that is showing up in some parts of the US, um, and this is what it is. Xylazine is an essential tool universally used by veterinarians who work on livestock. Uh, I actually happen to have sheep and I had one have a surgical procedure a couple of weeks ago and they actually use xylazine as the, as the, the, the medication. Um, it's very effective when used with animals. Uh, it's administered intravenously or intramuscularly. It has an effect that lasts about an hour when used as an anesthetic. Um, but it's not approved for use in humans. Um, there is a, an, an antidote. There is a reversal drug called tolazine, but it also is not approved for use in humans. Um, this is not a drug that's supposed to be used by human beings. Um, it's a drug that is chemically related to clonidine. Um, it's alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. And the, the major effect is sed sedation. It's not an opioid. And that's important to, to remember. It's not an opioid. Um, and so if a person has a xylazine overdose just with xylazine, naloxone will not reverse it. But xylazine is very rarely used alone. It's almost always used together with fentanyl. Um, the other effect, CNS depression, um, it, it will have that a real sedative effect and it lowers the blood pressure and um, in a dangerous way, similarly to clonidine and lofexidine. Um, so you get a profound sedation, um, anesthetic lasts for time to effect is a minute or two. This has a drug effect up to four hours Two to four hours is the major uh, duration of effect. Uh, it has, was studied in the 1960s as a potential antihypertensive um, and as an, uh, uh, an analgesic and hypnotic, but it's severe hypotensive effects and it was unstable hypotensive effects and central nervous system depressant effects made the risk benefit ratio um, impractical to develop it for humans. So it's not used and has not never been approved for use in humans. This is from NIDA. It's also called Trank, as in tranquilizer. Um, xylazine is central nervous system depression that can cause drowsiness, slow breathing, reduced heart rate, lowered blood pressure to dangerous levels. Taking opioids in combination with xylazine and other depressants like alcohol and benzos increasing life-threatening overdoses. So it's a drug that, uh, this is what it looks like. You can, veterinarians can order it. I, I think, I think non-veterinarians can order it. Um, it's mainly been centered in Philadelphia. The, the xylazine um, phenomenon has really uh, had its sort of 
headquarters in Philadelphia. It's been showing up there since the mid last decade, 2014, 15. There started to be higher rates of, of xylazine in the drug supply in Philadelphia. It's only been much more recently that it's traveled outside of Philadelphia and is now being disseminated around the country. This week, um, yesterday, I think there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle about four people overdose, fatal overdoses with xylazine in their uh, toxicology reports. And that made the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. As you see with the New York Post today, it's like, it's the new thing that's now arrived on the scene. Um, this is um, widespread distribution of xylazine throughout the US. This is a, a study published um, uh, last year that talks about the fact that it's now being seen in more and more places, including rural areas. Rural areas are, are certainly not uh, immune from this. Uh, I think it's safe to say that xylazine is being seen more in urban areas at this point, but it is as, as it is uh, disseminated, diffused throughout the country, uh, certainly rural areas will have their own challenges with xylazine. Um, to, to report an overdose routine testing for xylazine uh, is useful, although right now the, uh, there are no uh, xylazine test strips um, that are widely available. I'm trying to stay on top of that. I found a company, a company in Canada that's producing them. I think my colleagues at the at the syringe exchange in Burlington have found a source for them, but it's a brand new product. You can get xylazine tested in in laboratory uh, urine samples that go to a lab. There is there are xylazine tests available, but on test strips, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure how accurate the products are. This is from an article published last August. Uh, it's covered in, in the, this CORA uh, research spotlight. Again, the CORA website has this and other information on, on xylazine that you can get. Um, this article published in 2021, really gets into some of the details about the uh, use of xylazine in Philadelphia, because that really was ground zero for where this started to uh, develop. As mentioned in the article, there was some report of it being used in Puerto Rico back in the beginning of the, of the century, but um, the rates in Philadelphia have escalated rapidly from less than 2% of the overdoses in 2010 to, um, oh, I can't see, it's blocked on my slide, but higher rates, uh, much higher rates in recent years. Um, in rural communities, in any place that, that uh, xylazine is seen, uh, and certainly among rural communities, rural health providers, some of the knowledge that needs to be disseminated is, of course, what the overdose looks like and what the treatment for the overdose is because, and making sure that people know that it's not an opioid, but if you've got somebody that you think is in a, a xylazine overdose, you give them naloxone because they, the chances are probably 95%, they also have fentanyl on board because xylazine has been rarely seen by itself. It's always used together with uh, fentanyl. And the reason for that is in one of those earlier slides where they said fentanyl doesn't have legs, where fentanyl has a short acting action effect, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you add xylazine to it and it gets a longer effect. It, it, it extends the, the opioid-like effect along with its own tranquilizing effect. Um, so people take it because it seems to extend the, the fentanyl effects and rather than getting this 10 or 15 minute effect, you get an hour long effect, or at least that's how the people who uh, use it, what they report. The other thing that rural healthcare providers need to know is xylazine is uniquely, as far as I know, um, associated with these ulcers on the skin that occur from xylazine. 
I don't know what why they occur, to be honest. It's not at the injection sites, it's anywhere on the skin. And they, they will start as a small red dot and very rapidly grow to, you know, 50 cent piece ulcers of open uh, ulcerated skin. Very uh, dramatic wounds that are get infected very readily and um, are seen in a high proportion of people using xylazine. Um, this is, these are data from the state of Vermont and um, uh, the way my computer is laid out, I can't see the xylazine um, column, but you can see over the course of 2022, a higher proportion of the um, uh, xylazine, oh yeah, you can see that, yeah, that for example, in the month of July, there were 12 of the 29 xylazine overdose deaths, 29 overdose deaths, 12 of them had uh, xylazine involved. So we're seeing it in, in higher proportions uh, here in Vermont. The group at the uh, Haida uh, in New England said their data for um, the data they look at is that closer to 50% of the New England overdose deaths now have xylazine in them. So this is something that's showing up in in New England now in, in very high amounts. Um, the California report from the yesterday's San Francisco Chronicle, that was kind of a new thing. So it's going east to west. And I know a lot of places, um, I do work in Wisconsin, they're seeing it uh, show up there and as, as well. So it's something that does seem to be heading um, um, in east from an east to west trajectory. Xylazine in an overdose. Um, as I said, we this the uh, antagonist for xylazine isn't available for human use. Um, and so the main focus of a xylazine overdose is on use of naloxone to reverse the fentanyl that's in the drug supply. Now, it's possible if they don't have fentanyl that it's just a xylazine overdose. The, the best I've seen is they provide supportive care, monitoring blood pressure, monitoring uh, the sedation and breathing rate. And they may need to assist with breathing um, because that's xylazine uh, has, has, has those effects. But uh, for the most part, when you see, you know, someone who you think has had a xylazine overdose, it's likely that uh, you, you're gonna need to apply Narcan because there's fentanyl involved. They all, this is from a Massachusetts clinic where they've been seeing a significant amount of xylazine and this gives some of the tips that they use um, uh, in, with people with xylazine overdose. This is a picture of some of these um, ulcer, skin ulcers, that's not tattoos, those are uh, dried over uh, ulcerated uh, skins, uh, skin and this is not where he was injecting, this is simply on the surface of the skin. It happened on the legs, it can happen on on the arms and on the torso. The next set of slides comes from a presentation by Dr. Joseph uh, DeZorio from uh, Temple University. It's an excellent presentation. If you get a chance to hear him speak, he definitely is the one of the people with the best and most current information. Um, management of a xylazine overdose, blunted response to hypoxia due to sedation, need to check for airway occlusion, um, positioning the, the person, there is no, uh, as I said, there is no uh, antagonist for xylazine at the current time, and naloxone is often administered because it's, it's assumed that uh, there's fentanyl on board. Um, and this is, gives you some of the indication of that, simply using uh, Narcan as you would if you had somebody where you thought, well, this is a, a, a fentanyl overdose. Um, this is talking about the testing, uh, not currently available as a point of care test or urine immunoassay. Uh, it can be detected in the ser uh, serum and urine through thin layer chromatography and gas chromatography. Uh, it's excreted uh, relatively rapidly. I think you can pick it up for 24 to 48 hours in the urine test. Um, and this is, well, I mentioned to you that we had tracked down a Canadian company, this company, BTNX. I tell you about it. I don't know the quality of these. I don't know how available they are, but I know companies are developing uh, 
test strips. This is the company that uh, developed the fentanyl test strips, and they're now developing them for xylazine. Um, we don't know much about how to treat xylazine, someone who's been taking it chronically, but we assume it would be like, most like somebody who's been taking uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, they've been taking a sedative. When they stop taking it, they're going to have uh, rebound hypertension. Uh, they may have tachycardia, diastasis, anxiety, and agitation. Um, so, and it may overlap with opioid withdrawal if they've been taking it with fentanyl. So th this, this has not been well developed yet. This is still a pretty early um, uh, sort of best guess at what we need to do. Treat like a sedative hypnotic withdrawal, benzo, temporary benzo use, and possibly using clonidine or other uh, uh, blood pressure medications to keep the blood pressure from rebounding to a dangerous level. Um, and we're now seeing here in uh, Vermont and in other harm reduction uh, strategies, uh, the uh, providing people with wound care as part of a harm reduction kit, because you see this um, these wounds, they're so prevalent in uh, these skin ulcers. Um, some of this uh, vasculitis, the wound healing from, they, they get infected very commonly. Our folks at the Burlington Syringe Exchange at Safe Recovery have talked about very quickly sending their patients to the emergency room to get their uh, infected uh, wounds taken care of. Um, this is a really common thing. And as you, as this drug spreads, you need to be ready to take care of the, the, these, these wounds. This shows you some of the um, some of the treatment, washing them, and um, if you go on the internet, you can get some uh, particularly horrible looking pictures. So I won't uh, beat you over the head with those. But this is just some of the ideas, some of the things that could be involved in a harm reduction kit for people to have uh, good wound care, to be able to care for their own, um, take care of their own wounds caused by uh, xylazine. So I think I was supposed to get done at 10 of, and it's 13 of, so Amazing. I, I, I made it. I'm sorry, about, sorry for going so fast. I hadn't gone through those slides <laughs> in this amount of time, so I maybe overdid it with the speed dial, but um, I'm more than happy to answer questions now or over uh, if you send me an email. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rawson. Um, if you would like to go ahead and stop sharing, I will share a few slides here. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Rawson, again, for this amazing uh, presentation. We have a lot of interest um, in this uh, topic. And um, so the first thing that we need to do is share a quick poll. This is gonna take about one minute. I've launched it in the middle of your screen and we would love to have folks just go ahead and answer these four questions quickly. And then we, ha we um, have a couple things to go over uh, before Dr. Rawson will answer questions. Um, we had a lot of wonderful questions coming in, a lot of engagement um, in the chat. And um, we were so happy to see it. Thank you so much. We'll just take another couple seconds here to give more people a chance to answer. Now, this um, poll is not a requirement for getting your um, continuing ed credits. So if you miss your chance, don't worry. Um, we are just hoping to get some information for our evaluation and keep doing great webinars for everybody. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and um, just let folks know that you will receive an email uh, next week with the recording and the slides for this webinar, as well as instructions on claiming continuing ed credits. Um, we are sharing that information in the chat. I know there's a lot of a lot going on in the chat, but see if you can sort through, get that information. 
Our next Community Rounds webinar will be on Wednesday, March 29th, featuring Dr. Sarah Jacobs. It will be called Three Years of the COVID-19 Pandemic, What We've Learned and How It Can Make Us Better at Treating Rural Patients with Substance Use Disorder. And we hope to see you there. And finally, as you may know, Cora is one of three rural centers of excellence. The other two centers are the Fletcher Group located in Kentucky and you are Medicine Recovery Center of Excellence in Rochester, New York. We have included their website addresses on this slide and welcome you to check out the work that they are doing. And um, I will now hand it over to Eleanor Broy, who is going to facilitate questions for uh, Dr. Rawson. You can also see Dr. Rawson's email there on the screen if you want to contact him with questions. Take it away, Eleanor. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Dr. Rawson, for such an informative presentation. We've had several questions come in, so I'm going to start. Um, first, we have, are we seeing an increase in adulterated street substances due to the amount of drug seizures across the country, limiting the amount of available fentanyl heroin? So people are selling, who are selling are having to add additional substances to get a drug weight to sell. Um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think there's plenty of fentanyl around. I haven't heard of there being any shortages of fentanyl. Um, I think they're, they're, the, the, the drug supplies into the United States right now, uh, the trafficking of fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cocaine seem to be very available. There's not much heroin around, but there's um, those three seem to be coming in in very large quantities, um, and they, but they get adulterated, and, and now you're seeing this the, the use of uh, uh, xylazine is not because they can't get other drugs. It's because it, according to people who are using it, it helps to extend the effect of fentanyl, and so they are using it as an added drug, not because they can't get fentanyl, but as a way of making fentanyl last longer. I don't, I'm not sure that there's any, there this I'm sure has geographic differences, but I'm not aware of there being a shortage in the drug supply anywhere. If that was what I understood the question to be asking. Yes, thank you. Um, next question. You mentioned a few ways of preventing fentanyl overdose. Would you care to mention the efficacy of overdose prevention centers, such as On Point, um, NYC, and New York? Uh, overdose prevention centers are um, certainly uh, uh, from the experience of the folks in Vancouver and in some of the centers in Europe do appear to save lives. Um, they are, um, there's a lot of interest in their development in the United States. Rhode Island has um, opened several. I believe there's some in New York City. Um, I do think as part of an array of services, um, the overdose prevention centers are uh, certainly an important and useful part of that. The limitation is that they only serve a relatively limited geographic area. And so they're not going to have, for example, in a rural uh, area, overdose prevention centers probably aren't gonna play a big role because of the, the geography of people needing to go to a, the place multiple times a day to use. So uh, certainly part of the array of services I think that are important um, and certainly in urban centers, um, I think we'll see a lot more of these in, in upcoming years. Thank you. Um, next is related to the fentanyl test strips. Are there strips being developed that identify potency? Uh, good question. Uh, you just exceeded my knowledge on that one. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I should find out the answer to that. and and. Uh, I, we have we work with a, a, a NIDA toxicologist. I'll ask her and see if she can have any information. I'll get it back to the the, the uh, folks at Cora, and we'll we'll try to send that out as a, a blurb 
uh, to the, the folks who attended the session. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, what's the reality of fentanyl-laced cannabis? I've heard of it. Um, I don't know. I don't, I really don't know the answer to that. I've, I've heard of it. Um, I presume that there are instances of it occurring. Um, my gut reaction is that it's one of those boogeyman issues that were, you know, uh, is there, but I, I can't say, I, I really shouldn't even speculate. I, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Um, next we have, so there was some activity in the chat about poly substance use as a form of harm reduction. And so there's a large portion of overdose deaths in um, this individual's county in Oregon, which many are poly substance use overdoses. So is there ever a situation where poly substance use would be a form of harm reduction? Well, poly substance abuse refers to using multiple substances, um, either over time, you know, one of one followed by the other or all together at the same time where you're using cocaine, you're using benzos, you're using heroin, you're using, I mean, poly substance refers to using lots of, of different categories of drugs. I don't see how you could think about that as a harm reduction strategy. Um, it, it would, I've always found poly drug use to be a particularly blunt instrument as a term. Um, it, it depends on what the drugs are. I mean, if, if poly drug, to say you're using a bunch of different stuff, well, what is what are the drugs you're using? Because that makes a difference in how you're going to uh, work with the individual. Um, and so, yeah, no, I can't see, as I understand poly drug use, I don't see it as a as a potential harm reduction uh, approach. Now, if you're asking, should you encourage people to use less dangerous drugs as a harm reduction strategy? For example, rather than smoking meth, maybe you could smoke cannabis. Well, that would probably reduce people's risk of death if that's the kind of poly drug strategy you're talking about. But in general, with the term polydrug, it's uh, it's just too nonspecific to, to, to address. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, someone's curious about the use of ketamine and harm reduction. Um, and so what are your thoughts around this? Ketamine is a whole topic on its own. Ketamine is a, a serious medicine that is being seriously researched for a whole number of things and is not, it. I don't feel comfortable talking about it as being part of a street drug uh, uh, array anymore. It's a serious medicine that is being seriously evaluated by the NIH for depression and a variety of, uh, of other disorders. And um, there's there's a whole science on there that I don't know the, I'm not currently familiar with. Thank you. Um, this will probably be the last question. What Do you have any um, strategies for what can be done to make the xylazine test strips more available sooner rather than later? Well, I think actually, I think my colleagues in Burlington are are uh, have tried getting a hold of some of those uh, companies because there there was that one I had the the um, on the slide the Canadian company and there's a couple of other companies that they said they had found that may be selling them again. We'll try to get you that information and get it out to see if what they found. I I'm not systematically researching that, but we'll see if we can get you some more information on that and send it out to the participants uh, who, are, who are in this uh, webinar. Great. That'd be wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Rawson. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, and again, much appreciation for this amazing presentation and um, all of your um, answers. Of course, there's a lot of interest, a lot of um, 
productive conversation in the chat among participants, people helping each other out, answering each other's questions. Um, so a really lively discussion and it's been wonderful. Um, so thank you so much. And um, we, it, you know, again, if, if we've run, we've run out of questions, a, a time for all the questions, we will do our best to follow up with um, via email um, to get some answers to you. And if you have anything else you'd like to ask us, we can answer you at Cora at uvm.edu. Um, that's our email. You can also contact Dr. Rawson at the email on the screen. And um, thanks again for joining. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.